This evening, we welcome Colin Thubron, acclaimed travel writer and novelist, and President Emeritus of the Royal Society of Literature. His first books were about the Middle East, Damascus, Lebanon, and Cyprus. In 1982, he traveled by car into the Soviet Union, a journey he described in Among the Russians. From these early experiences came his, came his classic travel books, Behind the Wall, The Lost Heart of Asia, In Siberia, Shadow of the Silk Road, and To a Mountain in Tibet. Colin's latest book, The Amur River Between Russia and China, was published in September this year. Colin served as president of the RSL from 2010 to 2017, and in 2020, as part of our 200th birthday celebrations, he was named an RSL Companion of Literature, the highest honor we can bestow. Guiding tonight's travels through literature is Sir Michael Palin, the author of 10 travel books, two novels, and a non-fiction work, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Michael's work has taken him across the, the globe, from the dunes of the Sahara to the heights of the Himalayas, and retracing the steps of Ernest Hemingway across three continents. He has written and performed in the Monty Python series, which a few of you may be familiar with, ripping arms and numerous travel documentaries, including Around the World in 80 Days, Pole to Pole, and Michael Palin in North Korea. Michael received a BAFTA Academy Fellowship Award in 2013, and I'm now very pleased to pass over to him and Colin. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Molly, for that introduction. I'm really, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here, especially with Colin, who's a, a, a writer I hugely admire. Very penetrating, very pithy, very clear, lucid, wonderful writing style. Rather envy him. Um, particularly the Emma River book, which I like because it appeals to my sense of going off piste. I mean, no one, as far as I know, knows anything about the Emma River, apart from you who know everything about it. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful, terrific uh, read. But I thought that tonight, we're, we're going to have a sort of conversation, really, together. Um, and I thought we'd start off by both of us addressing the question which was put to me by an eight-year-old boy in an event I did about um, four days ago. He said, um, how old were you when you wanted, first, how old were you when you first wanted to travel? Which I thought that's a good start. How old were you? Uh, I was excited about it when I was about seven or eight mm. because my father was working in Canada and in the States and I was sent back to school in England miserably so I'd have holidays out there and um, school in England. It gave me a very early sense that school was very boring among the gorse bushes of Ascot and out there was exciting, so abroad was exciting. And you can imagine a boy from war-torn England um, just after the war, being in Times Square. I'd never seen a neon light in my life mm. and the great lakes of Canada. Um, so I got an abiding sense that um, travel was uh, exciting. Well, you got that abiding sense, the fact you had travelled a bit, you had seen yep. these wonderful mm. things. I mean, for me, travelling was entirely in the imagination mm. because I was in Sheffield and nobody left Sheffield, really, apart from to go <laughs> possibly to Nottingham. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or prison, or no, I mean, no, that's messed up there. Um, but it, it, so, so my interest in travel was a purely a, a sort of imaginative leap into a world in which everything was possible. You could go to the North Pole, you could go to the Gobi Desert, mm. but only through books, mm. through um, magazines. You would never actually go there. But I, uh, uh, certainly on the outskirts of Sheffield, there was rather some wonderful crags very, very sort of dramatic scenery. And there I would, I would sort of play out my fantasies of a traveler in the American West or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I never really knew what travel was about until were, were much books, later. Michael, were, were there particular books a bit later that um, made you think? Well, oh. a lot of, yes, almost all the books I read, you know, from Biggles onwards, uh, were, mm. were about distant places. And mm. Biggles was always going off somewhere, mm. although, I believe his creator, Captain W. Johns, wrote them all while sitting in a 
room in Twickenham. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, good for him, imagination yeah. again. But also, I mean, stories, uh, I suppose, Conan Doyle, The Lost yeah. World, you remember yes, books like that, that. Ryder, yes, Ryder Haggard, yeah. and all those. You, you know, these, these were just books about people who went to places that you didn't really believe existed. Yeah. Um, did you have the same? Uh, what, what, what were your sort of literary mine background were, at mine that time? Mine were late. I had rather predictable idols like Patrick Lee Fermer and Freya Stark. Ah, um, mm. There were sort of moments in those books that made me absolutely tingle with the magic of them. Mm. Um, and uh, they were the ones, really. And oddly enough, well, not only, well, Wilfred Thesiger. And quite early ones, um, King Lake, Eotham, mm. and some of these quainter. 18th century travel writers. So there, were, there was quite a, a panoply of different influences. But actually, the main influence on me was Palgrave's Golden Treasury. I just read poetry. Really? Well, yeah. the others yeah. were reading Bulldog Drum and I was reading poetry. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, um, and that had a... Well, was that an influence uh -huh. from your, your school or parents? or what? Um, what It was a that? slight influence from my mother. Mm. Um, because she, her name was Dryden, her maiden name, and she was a collateral oh, of descendant yes. of John Dryden. Yeah, yeah. And she thought this was hugely important and I must have inherited everything mm. from Dryden. Yes. In fact, I couldn't be more different from Dryden, who was a rather fine but slightly cynical literary critic and satirist. Really? Well, and I had no doubt. Okay, they're any, not that different, I don't think, Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, th that was an influence. Yeah. You see, your influence is straight away more highbrow than mine, or maybe you just came you, you later, just later in life. I was a late developer. Yeah, but, but I, even when <laughs> I was developed later, I suppose I was, I was quite influenced by people like Hemingway. I was influenced by him purely as a writing stylist. I couldn't believe when I was at school you were reading the kind of terse, journalistic prose that he wrote. Right. It seems so different from from what we were being taught, the Edwardian books and all that sort of thing, yes. it was rather sort of flowery prose and all that. But so, so I, I sort of fell for Hemingway. And, and later, uh, you know, I, I realised that, that Hemingway was a great traveller. Yeah. He was a great traveller because he, 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 he went off to different parts of the world to write, um, but lived there as well. I mean, for instance, yeah. he went to Cuba, and instead of living in the, in the, where the legations were and all that amongst all the other foreigners, he bought a house on the outskirts, well, you know, in the local area. So he seemed to steep himself very much in local people. And I think, you know, from your writing and probably my inclination, we like to talk to people, we like to talk to the, you know, the, 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 the population rather than yes. the politicians or the powerful people. Yes. Well, it, it's a different take, isn't it, when writing when mm. uh, for a different purpose. In the Amor River book, you know, although the, the heart of it was the relationship between China and Russia mm. on the actual borders of, of the river where for a thousand miles they are facing one another across mm. the river. Um, actually, um, you know, what one wanted was to know what, not what Beijing and Moscow were saying to one another, but what people actually yes. there were yeah. feeling. And those sort of things are part of the... But the he, he, uh, uh, from the book, I, me I remember you saying that these people were so far away from the centre of government, is that right, from, from yeah. you know, yeah. Moscow or, yeah. or Beijing, yeah. um, that they didn't really know quite, you, you know, they, they didn't interpret politics or see politics the way we in the West would, you know, putting ourselves here and yeah. Moscow there, powerful place and all that. No, the Russians, certainly in that area, feel they've been abandoned by Moscow, yeah. really that they've been left to face. You know, two million Russians on one side of the river and 110 million Chinese on the mm. other in the provinces facing one another. No wonder they're worried. Yeah. Was there, I mean, when you were there, was there host, were there hostilities between the two? I can't remember. No. I mean, there was a sort of balance, was it? There the, had been. Yeah. Um, um, during the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese had really almost insisted on the fact that the river belonged to them which by treaty it had been. The, the Russians took it away from them mm. um, in the mid-19th century, and the Chinese had never forgotten it. Um, you know, all the other imperial powers, like Britain, France, so on, mm. gave back the possessions they'd taken from China. Um, only Russia has never rescinded, and they, they remember this. Yeah. So it, it's, a curious, um, it's a curious situation in which officially the border has been um, 
established, but in fact, the Chinese have never, have never mm. actually rescinded the idea that the treaty by which mm. Russia took it was, they say, unequal, mm. and they they went uh, they went go back on that. Wow, I see. Yeah. So yeah. you know, you know, you know, no. yeah. But when when you when you uh, I'm kind of interested in how you choose a place when you decide to travel. Um, I mean, you tend to. To tend to go for places where, where well, I say slightly off piste, mm-hmm. but also you've been to you've been to Moscow, you've been to Russia, you've been to mm-hmm. China as well. I mean, what, what, what when you're thinking about a journey and the writing you've got to do for that journey, um, how, how do you begin to make judgments on where you go? Um, usually, the itinerary is selected by the research initially. Um, while, while I'm actually researching an area like this one, for instance, um, certain places seem to speak to you mm. because you feel they have a special influence or, or something that piques your curiosity. For mm. instance, when I was in China, um, I went to Mao Zedong's home village, which mm. during the Cultural Revolution was covered in red guards, marching and celebrating, and I wondered what had happened. Um, in mm. the mid nineteenth century, in mid nineteen eighties, mm. late nineteen eighties, to this place, and of course you find it deserted, and it was for those sort of reasons that you, I find myself choosing places. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for all sorts of reasons, mm. as as you. But but, but, you, but the research. Where do you begin the research? I mean, do you, do you, are you, are you, is it in your head for a long time? Are you looking at? Other books and getting influenced by them, or reading news reports. I just wonder where you, where, where it all begins. I'm shamelessly reading other books. I'm here in the British Library, good, yeah. or in the School of Oriental <laughs> Studies. Good, good answer. Yeah, good yeah. answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, um, and mm. I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn languages or to mm. brush up languages. Mm. Very bad Russian, even worse Mandarin, but enough to converse with people. Mm. So. Quite a lot of the time goes to that. So you spend, in my case, a year and a half probably in research before I even go. Mm-hmm. And then there's this um, long period of writing afterwards, which is at least a year. And in the middle is this rather unheroic little period of mm-hmm. four or five months in which you're actually travelling and doing the important thing. Do you, when you travel, how important a, a, a sort of gathering material, how important is it to take? Notes, recordings. I mean, obviously, very important. But how do you how do you deal with that? Do you have notebooks, recording, well, cassette machines? Unlike whatever? you, I'm sure have technology. Um, I have these miserable little notebooks. No, I have miserable well, you little have, notebooks. You do too, don't yeah, you? I do. Yes, yes, do. yes. Yeah. yes the uh, Allwich, the Allwich All Weather Notebook. I have yeah. made yeah. in Glasgow, right. and unfortunately, they've now gone out of business. Oh, oh yes, my God! Which That's is a pity because they're. they're you sell them on my website, actually. Yeah, that's the end anyway, of travel. You <laughs> I'll get you one. Yeah. Right, OK. No, sorry. So you, you yeah. No, I have Keep these notes. tiny little notes. Luckily, my writing is very small and miserable, so that um, <laughs> I can get a lot in a tiny notebook. I had an editor who accused me of owning a little matchbox of ants, which I dipped in ink and ran over the page. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But in fact, um, uh, my writing is naturally illegible. Um, fortunately, because the one time I... You, you get terrified, at least I, I mm. do, because there's no sort of backup, that they're mm. going to be lost or yes. confiscated, because yes. if the notes are gone, then the book's gone, because my memory is very average, and if I... Um, mm. If I lost all the detail, that yeah. sort of which makes for the life of the description, that will be lost to me. I remember nearly losing it um, on a journey in the Soviet Union. Mm. I'd been in by car, arrived at the customs post at a mm. place with the sinister name of Chop on the, yes. um, the mm. check border. Yeah. And uh, I'd been followed by the KGB and they took the car to bits and they took yeah. my luggage to bits. Then I was hauled down to the bowels of this customs office mm. and the one thing they couldn't decipher was the notebooks. And there was this heavy block of a KGB officer, sort of yes. pantomime KGB officer, and he was going through them and he said, have you developed this writing specially 
That's my writing. And he said, yeah. he, he saw a few headings. He saw Odessa. I said, read me out about Odessa. Yeah. So I read how the, I left out the dissidents <laughs> I'd seen. I said how the birds were singing. And the, yes, that was a lovely, the lovely sun place. Sun was sparkling yeah. on yeah. the waves. Yeah. After about half an hour, he said, this is very poetic. Said, <laughs> yeah. you, you could publish this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I did. <laughs> but I, love but it. I was sure as I was reading through that he was going to confiscate it and that would be the end of the book. Mm, yeah, well, I'd, I'd lose the notebook. No, I, I, I do know because I've been in that position. I, we were um, filming a New Europe series and we had been to the three Baltic republics, Estonia, yeah. Latvia and Lithuania. Um, and, and all full of rich material and it was all in my notebooks. And the next place we were going to was, um, was Hungary. And we were at the, the airport there. And um, uh, it must have happened in a, in a couple of minutes, but my bag was stolen from the... I remember the, that. Yeah. The thing. Yeah. And the, yeah. all the material on the Baltic Republic's completely gone. Yeah. And I, I, sort of, I, I really freaked out. I, I wandered around the airport looking at, and there was a yeah. kind of area just where, where they collected, mm. where taxes arrived and all that. And we, we were all looking in the garden beds and things <laughs> like that to see if someone had opened the bag, taken whatever money was it, and thrown, yeah. hopefully, thrown yeah. the notebook, yeah. Yeah. which was completely useless mm. away. But I never found it. But you and sort of reassembled, you said, I think you I, reassembled I did, the data I, somehow. I sat down in, in the hotel mm. um, in Budapest and spent a day trying to remember what I'd seen and what I'd done. Yeah. Mm. And extraordinary, actually, how much did, did come back. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I just had to, I had to bring it back. Yeah. But mm. there would be many little moments and many little bits of detail, yeah. which you write down, which had gone forever. Yeah. Little things you see, sort of writings on the walls and all that sort of stuff. Well, this um, would, one of the things about your books is that um, they're, they're not just duplicates of the film. I mean, of course, they are in a way, but there are those moments all the time where you are off camera and those things come into the books yeah. too, where you're maybe not in solitude exactly, but you're on your own. And um, there, there's some other quite different material. Yeah. I mean, that really goes down to my wanting to be a, a, a sort of... Um, you know, a proper travel author like yourself. Actually, travel writing, I don't know, I remember asking Jan Morris about that, talking this, and Jan Morris didn't like to be thought of as a travel writer. No travel writers do. No, I don't think they do, because <laughs> it's a sort of travel writer, it's like something you do for the yeah. Daily Mail sort mm. of holiday supplement, right. and that's about yeah. it. No, we don't do that <laughs> anyway, if only. Um, <laughs> um, but but I, I think the point is that I very much, uh, I very much wanted to write well about the places I'd been to. And uh, unlike you, uh, most of the time I was there with a the film crew and we were there to deliver a sort of visual thing as well. Yeah. So there was um, a lot of sort of talking to people on camera, walking through markets, waiting to sort of be queued to go and do this, that and the other. Do the local dance, Michael. They're having a local dance. Mm -hmm. In you go, join in. Which is really embarrassing. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's a dance they've done for 2,000 years and you yes, come in so oh, <laughs> club up about. But anyway, so there's all that which I did for the camera and was very happy to do and, and, and yet um, in the evenings I always used to sit down and, and try and remember my own head, mm -hmm. what I'd seen and the things that I'd seen. Yeah. As you rightly say, the camera, you know, I see things the cameraman might have missed and, and the cameraman similarly will go off and shoot uh, cutaways of people which immeasurably enrich the series. Yeah. But it was, I did, I did want to write, and I, I was interested because your books I, I never have illustrations of any kind, do you? Never have photos. Not the later ones, no. No, and no. that presumably was a, a deliberate decision of your own because... It was a publisher's decision in a way. Okay. Yeah. To begin with, I thought they just didn't want to give me illustrations. They, they mm. were being cheap, yeah. but they weren't. In fact, they had a rationale, which was that with my sort of writing, I suppose they feel that um, the reader is yeah. experiencing the place through my eyes rather than his own, her, her own. Yeah. Um, and so they feel the illustrations restore to the reader's mm. vision, the reader's um, yeah. uh, perspective. And they didn't want that. They wanted a full immersion um, mm. into my narrative, into mm. my story. So that was the reason for it. And, uh, well, uh, I, 
I don't object to that. No, I mean, I think if you, you describe things so, so well, so fluently, you don't really need boom, the, the lake or the mountain or whatever. But uh, I was doing my, my, my travels were for a sort of BBC Books no, audience. Yeah. And also, I, I must say, I was very lucky to have with me a guy called Basil Pao, Chinese working out of Hong Kong. Um, who had done various books and photographed John Lennon and people like that. And he came with me because he loved travelling. He's a wonderful, wonderful traveller, Basil. Very, mm -hmm. always try any local drink anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and he was uh, Chinese. He knew all about food. Wherever he went, in, anywhere in Asia, mm -hmm. you'd go into a restaurant. We'd sit there and say, mm, this is a bit nice. Have you the menu? You don't need the menu. Mm -hmm. And he would go in the kitchen and there'd be a lot of shouting. And eventually he said, I've got something to they're going to produce something special. They always did. So he was a great, great... And he, he did all the photographs, and actually they're, they're, they're wonderful. They're wonderful photographs, so I was kind of pleased with that. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, it means we approach places from a slightly different way. And you, of course, you know, are, seem to be, anyway, largely a solitary traveller. I mean, you meet lots of people along the way, but you seem to want to be there in a very uncluttered way. You don't take too many people with you. You don't take anybody with you, really. No. So no. explain well, a little of that. Well, nobody's stupid enough to go with me. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I do value. I, I seem to need the solitude. And I think, um, uh, I think if you're on your own, um, for one thing, I would spend too much time worrying about the person I was with the more I liked them, the more I'd worry about them because yes. of the difficult conditions. But mainly, I think it's that I think if you travel with just one other person, presumably of your own culture, mm. you make a little pocket of comfort together from which you look out and find yes. the world um, odd or different or mm. strange. If you're on your own, you're the strange one. Mm. And I think you're forced more quickly into some sort of attempted understanding of where you are. Mm. Um, it's more uncomfortable. Um, you're more vulnerable, of course, but um, you're certainly more sensitive mm. in my yeah. case. Also being alone invites people to join you. I think if they see you with, certainly the Russians say, see you with one other person, they think you're a party. Um, if you're alone, they tend to think you're lonely mm. and um, people will approach you more easily. I've found huge advantages Mm. to being alone. I would say it seems yeah. to be sort of natural yeah. for me. Um, I, I feel more excited by places if I'm on my own. So when mm. you go, you're, you're in sort of somewhere, a town on the Amar River or, or, or somewhere where you know, they're not familiar with foreigners. Um, do, do you kind of, you go to a restaurant, sit in a, take a drink or a cup of tea or something like that, do you, do you talk to people? I mean, do you, presumably you've got to, um, at some point, try yeah. and make friends with the local people, or mm. do you just wait yeah. and uh, take it easy it and see? It sort of happen. I don't yeah. have any technique for it. Mm. Um, I find most people are fairly friendly and, and probably rather curious about mm. you. They wonder what you are, and, and so they'll sort of yes. sidle towards you. Often, um, you can be overwhelmed by people occasionally, um, mm. um, racketing to, to yes. have access yes. to you. Um, more often you have a quiet you know, moment or something. It, it's, a lot of it seems to be luck and fluke. Um, but I do occasionally go with somebody in the Amur River book. I yes, have some lovely to, companions. Yeah. I, well, I, on the Mongolian side, I had to because yeah. that was a forbidden area and you had to have guides and horsemen and so mm. on. But in other parts too, I was lucky to fall in with, with local people, mm. mainly Russians. Yeah, yeah. You, you, uh, another thing is, is how you sort of prepare for journeys, and I was going to say, you know, physically it's quite important to be in fairly good shape. Mm. But in the Amma River, of course, in the book there, you have a terrible fall from the horse. <laughs> Is it? You, I mean, you broke various bits of your body. Yeah. And then, I mean, you were in the middle of, oh, you weren't near a, um, a convenient hospital, particularly, were you, at the time? <laughs> so, no. so, well, this was in a, it's where the Amur River begins as the Onon, which is a, a little, the mm. furthest source is in Mongolia. It arises in an area of about 5,000 square miles on the Russian border. Mm. So it's a restricted area. Um, I got uh, permission to go with a guide and two horsemen. 
And, but the monsoons had been very heavy that year, and it was a morass. And we had 10 days of awful floundering. The horsemen even said it was the worst journey they'd ever done. And the horses fell and panicked. And um, in the end, uh, the, the last straw was my horse simply disappeared into a bog and rolled on top of me. Oh, and um, my oh. one, I had one foot out of the stirrup, but the other was caught in my, an old trainer in the stirrup. And um, it started to drag me through the mud. Oh, yeah. Luckily, my cheap trainer, I, I managed to get my foot out of it, and the horse went off with the trainer, and I was left in the mud. It was my Monty Python moment. <laughs> and, and, uh, There's a horse somewhere scampering around with one off. Adidas yeah. left boot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I did, um, yes, I know I had but a couple... Mean, you couple laugh of, now, it must well, have been at the time, Come um, on. you must have felt oh, like enough. giving up, did you? Uh, no, I'm not giving up really, but I did persuade myself that my broken ribs were only fractured mm. and my broken ankle was only sprained. Yeah. And so I went on. But in a way, you know, I'd have had to come back to London, I'd have been mm. x-rayed, they'd have said, I'd have lost a whole year of life, mm. which at my time of life is too much, <laughs> can't afford a year. So uh, you just... With broken ribs, you can't do anything no, anyway. No, you no. just have to n not not cough and not laugh. Yeah. I didn't have a cough, and there's nothing to laugh about. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you don't want jokers, I no, remember. No, no, and don't I want you, Michael. On no, the, no, I, I, <laughs> I was in hospital for having my appendix out, quite young, about, you know, we hadn't even started doing Python. And there was a wonderful ward, and there was... The, uh, my friends used to come. I had one or two people <laughs> with senses of humour who used to come and see me. And one of the patients in there had had something done to his backside and it had been stitched very painfully mm. and been told to do it, not, don't cough, don't laugh, whatever. Mm. And he had an enormous sense of humour. Oh. He just found everything <laughs> funny. The poor man, so he'd say something, he'd go, oh, wow, oh, oh. <laughs> so, you know, there we go. Yeah. But, but I, I do know because what we were talking about, because I actually, when we did some filming in the Zambezi River, whitewater rafting, which I'd never done before, and it was just, you know, not far from the Victoria Falls. There was a lot of water and a lot of foam, a lot of white water. But they said, oh, it'll be all right, you know, you'll be fine. And it was terrifying, but rather exhilarating. Um, we went through nine rapids. At the end of it, they... Um, We'd, we were, I was so exhilarated, I, I let myself be persuaded by the other people in the boat, who were sort of local Zimbabweans actually, um, to swim to the shore. They said, the nice thing is a lovely pool there, swim to the shore, and we'd just relax on the shore and you'd have a wonderful time and get you a beer and all that. And I thought, all right. But on the rocks, I mean, we'd just mm -hmm. come down the rocky path. Oh, no, no, not if you go that way. And so just, they said, just drop off the back of the boat and float down. And it's, it all sounded completely heavenly and wonderful. And I dropped off the boat and immediately hit a rock. You know. <laughs> and uh, it was quite, I was quite deep down. I came to the surface. Unfortunately, the, the sort of the shouts of swear words were exactly the right thing to do because I expelled all the air before going down again, hitting another rock. Anyway, long, <laughs> the end of the story was that I, I cracked a rib and we were, we were going on to, we still had... Um, about five weeks travel to the South Pole. So I went to the South Pole with a cracked rib. I don't talk about that much. But this, this is not on camera? This is, no. Well, no, it wasn't on camera, exactly that. Mm -hmm. the, the director said to me the next, and if completely unsympathetic, he said, next time you do that, wait till the camera's running. Yeah. <laughs> right, yes. Um, so uh, I, I do know, but anyway. And a few times I've done this, it's the cameraman would usually say, that I, well, you have to do that again. There's a, there's a hair in my lens. Oh, yes, yes, you know, that's you, right. You have that, ever had that? The, of the course you did. Shot, yes, you? yes, you did. You have worked with the film, film crews. Only that, you? twice, and yeah. not, um, not like you, not with great success. One, one was not a bad film, I think. He had a good director. The other, so-so. But I, I, never, I never developed a nice... Um, an attractive screen presence like you yeah. did. Yeah. Oh. I would seem too intense mm. or something. Um, they, they weren't... Um, I don't know, all the, all the best moments seem to happen off camera mm. with yes. us. Yes, yes. I remember yeah. I was meant to go into the Taklamakan Desert with a train of camels, <laughs> heroically alone. Yeah. Of yeah. course, the huge camera crew behind me. Yeah. And the BBC had got in these camels ages in advance. Yeah. And they'd got the wrong camels. They turned out to be... Um, uh, herd animals, not pack animals. Mm. 
So the camel oh. crew loaded all their stuff onto these mm. camels. But I know if I went, but the camels weren't used to having this stuff. They mm. simply took over over the desert, chucking <laughs> thousand pound lenses left and right, tripods <laughs> and things. We spent all day yes. picking these things out of the sand. Yes. It would have been a wonderful bit of cinema for A.T., but yes. we couldn't film it because the camels had the cameras. That's a problem, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. But this seemed to be yeah. the sort of things... Well, that we... we um, uh, the, the, the sort of idea of the programmes that I did were that the camera would follow me everywhere. So there wasn't really a sort of... We did set pieces, but it wasn't really set up. It was Michael, let's get into this, let's see what happens. Mm. Nigel Meakin, as my cameraman, was brilliant at just capturing a moment... So generally speaking, we we, um, we 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 caught we caught a lot of moments, and it was in a, it was a, I relaxed into it. Around the world in eighty days, I was very nervous because yeah. I didn't know what I was supposed to be. Was I supposed yeah. to be an actor? Was I supposed to be um, a journalist? Was I supposed mm -hmm. to be me? In the end, it was me mm -hmm. showing all my sort of confusion and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was. But there were things that that we missed. I mean, one of my favorite was just. It's a most extraordinary thing because we filmed at the North Pole, on, as one does, on this plane and flew, we're going to fly to Svalbard and that's where we're going to stay the night. Um, but the, a big storm came and we had to divert to um, a Danish Air Force base at the very northern tip of Greenland, um, utterly remote, two Air Force base. And it was the middle of the night and they allowed us to land. And when we landed, they just said, well, there's some huts down there. I think they've got some accommodation. Um, just just um, go down there and they'll, they'll give you a bed for the night. And we went to this hut and knocked on the door. And they said, oh, yes, come on in, come on. That's good, yes. And suddenly a man saw me and the blood drained out of his face yeah. completely. And he began to sort of quiver slightly. And he looked at me. And I sort of edged in, and the first thing I saw on the table was a, 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 a tape of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, <laughs> which they'd been watching the night before. And he just could not believe that this remote part of northern Greenland was spotted. Uh, anyway, did this come on camera? Uh, no, we didn't, though. That's uh, the point of the story. We missed yeah, that because, uh, of course, the camera's all packed away. But I some of your off-camera things are, are wonderful. I always remember in the Sahara book when you're following a caravan train, you decide you're going to go on foot. Isn't oh, yes, yeah. Following the salt caravan. Yes. And you're going too slowly. Yeah. And slowly this mm. caravan's moving yeah. away from you and you're behind it. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody can share that awful experience that you're just going to be left behind. Yes. Um, but in the middle of the Sahara, it's yes. not the places to no. be left behind. No, that was... Yeah. I completely misjudged that. I thought somehow camels walk quite slowly. I'll walk slowly. Yeah. I don't mind. It's a hot day. I've yeah. got some water. I drank all the water in the first five minutes. Mm. It was so hot. Yeah. And the camels move slowly but very steadily. Yeah. You know a, how they move? They're brilliant. It's a, it's a they long, make no, hardly any mark trip. on the sand. No. 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 Well, their paws expand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that was a sort of moment that you were off camera. Yeah, and, um, but it yes. comes in the book. Yes, quite a, no, no, quite well, a that's, shock. That's, that's nice that the book has different things. I suppose we should talk a bit about our literary, the literary side of these things. I mean, mm. I, I was uh, just reading because I knew we were going to talk about um, um, Richard Kapuscinski, the, the author, because yes. he interests mm. me quite a lot, and I read a lot of his books, and he was very much about, about the philosophy of travel and the idea of the other. You know, and that, that's something that we can't really understand because we always approach travel in a slightly sort of looking at them in a slightly superior way. And, and he, he was saying how difficult it was for us to really understand the other, something that is quite different. Yes, from it's almost a religious sense of that. I yes. Think, in some way. Do you know anything about him? And do, do you, Not do much. You know I, mean, I followed his footsteps in parts of Siberia. And it's wonderful writing. It's very evocative yes. and very inaccurate. Yeah. Um, it, it's extraordinary <laughs> what he got wrong. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, in a gulag in Fokuta, I remember, a gulag area, mm. um, I looked at the, um, the, the regions that he had covered. Yes. And um, he, there, there's one in particular, a, a graveyard of, of, of um, ex-convicts. And for, on each grave, there was a, a cross, you know. Yes. Um, and I went round with a, 
um, somebody from Memorial, the Russian um, institution for memorizing and documenting mm. these yeah. things. And they said, oh, yes, they knew a few things of people. But um, Kapuscinski described these places where a um, hundred or a thousand were buried in great pits under each cross. Mm. Um, it was sort of nonsense. And um, similarly, he thought there were no shops in some Siberian towns. Mm. And all shops in North Siberian towns mm. have got padded doors. They don't have mm. windows or anything. You wouldn't know they were. You have to go inside. Mm. Mm. And he made strange elementary mistakes mm. like this. But, but he was an awfully interesting it's writer. Really, it's that, alarming, that, though, isn't it? Because he was an interesting writer, and I still sort of recommend people to read, read his mm. work. And yet, when you hear that, it's just completely sort of made yes. a lot up. I think, does, does that totally yeah. devalue his, his work? And no, I don't think yeah. so. Um, for some African writers in particular, experts, they ready to cry him um, for inaccuracy. Yeah. But still, the potency of those in the book on Ethiopia, of course, um, they're very powerful. Mm. Do you, I mean, uh, when you sort of take your notes and all that, I mean, presumably you, like me, try to be as accurate as you possibly can, yes. but how do you replicate conversations that you have? And, and I mean, I, I'm, I've tried to do that. It's quite difficult, um, um, even just an hour or two afterwards. And yet... I mean, someone like Paul Theroux, for instance, it's got whole swathes. But mm. uh, uh, what, do you, what do you feel about that? Does it worry you, or do you feel if you've got it mostly right, it's OK? Um, it worries me. Um, I, I don't take a tape recorder, um, right. which I've, I've never liked the idea of formally interviewing somebody yes, yeah. because they immediately become reticent or theatrical or there is something mm. almost unnatural about it, almost always. Mm. So I've tried to remember, and I almost immediately after conversation, if it's exciting me, I'll go off and <laughs> scribble down everything I can remember, mm. um, which is usually all the sort of potent part of the conversation, mm. which I think usually, I hope, I've remembered fairly accurately yeah. anyway. Maybe not word for word, but quite a lot of the expressions people use if yeah. they're unusual. Um, and of course, an awful lot gets left out. Mm. Um, it's everything that gets omitted that is one's often unconscious choice. Yeah, so Venice well, yeah. Was, was really the first book about um, a, um, a foreign city, a foreign place, which uh, totally captivated me and made me feel that I understood what that kind of writing was about. Yeah. Um, because, because he had a, a way of sort of um, taking you with him to, to a place, you know, you're, uh, and, and being kind of, and pointing out things quite emotionally every now and then, and not being afraid to disguise the sort of romantic side of what he felt about places. So it wasn't just a description of a sunset, it would be a description of a sunset and how you felt, how, how he, the writer, felt as he saw that sunset. I hadn't seen that much of that before. What, what, how do you rate Jan? And a lovely book on Spain. Called, I think, the essence of Spain. Mm. And again, he would take subjects like, you know, catismo or certain Spanish characteristics and write about them with a lot of, um, uh, not embroidery, but illustration yeah, of yeah. cities and, and landscapes and things mm. in Spain. And that was a, a lovely talent. He, he, she, she had a touch of the me melancholic, I liked the melancholic. And you do a bit, don't you? You write so well about sort of things that might have happened or places what they might have been and what they are now, which I think is, is just, is, is, appeals to me greatly yeah. because there is a sort of melancholy when you travel anywhere, I think. Yes. Isn't I, there? I think prob I do travel to other melancholy places, I have to say. Well, yeah, well, um, yes. do you, cho yeah, you choose I, them because you think you're going to be... Maybe. <laughs> no, that's interesting, I, yeah. I, I'm not sure why one chooses places. Mm. In my case, it's been very odd. Um, there's been a sort of transition from writing about small places in the Middle East, like Lebanon and yeah. Cyprus, which are half the size of Wales. And then suddenly I went off and started going to countries that you couldn't possibly encompass properly with yeah. research, like the old Soviet Union or China. Mm. So there's, there's complete break. Yeah. 
which happened curiously enough when I had a road accident in 1978, um, and I was lying in hospital with a broken spine. Um, and this was not in Outer Mongolia. I had the accident in East Grinstead. Um, and, uh, That's and, a melancholy place. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And, um, and for some reason, uh, it made me want to do something or mm. gave me some maybe feeling of mortality that I'd better go and visit somewhere um, mm. less that I couldn't encompass, really, couldn't really completely understand with thousands of years of mm. research, but somewhere like Russia, as it was then, mm. um, that I would just take the risk yeah. and see what happened. Yeah, I mean, you, you write so well about, I mean, um, the Russian and China books, I love both of them. I, mean, I, think, I can't remember what you said about um, um, Russia, but there's a kind of, um, so, uh, the landscape was defined by an absence. Mm -hmm. An absence. You were able to sort of make a lot of the fact that there was really nothing particularly there, and yet it was a very strong. You, that's, anyone who's been to sort of the, the Russian steppes and all that, that's exactly well, what know, it is. You know, it. Yeah. yes. That. I mean, was that sort of. Well, I suppose what I'm trying to say is do you, you don't mind when things aren't spectacular or, or there, aren't a, there isn't a lot happening? You actually find in your writing a sort of satisfaction of describing something where, where there is an, is an absence of... of, of yes, I often find absence in a way spectacular if mm. there are many miles of it. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't require, I think, that, that sort of um, drama in a landscape that um, mm. Princess Jan Morris loved yeah. um, no, and, and that you love. Ooh, well, you, you know, I think, but it's interesting talking to you because I really, what I'm, I do admire what you do because I'd quite like to do that myself. I mean, the way I travel tends to be for an entertaining television audience. So one goes in there and, and you've got to, you've got to balance up all the various elements, you know, a good interview with a, an industrial thing, something about shipbuilding. <laughs> I used to have terrible jokes when we did our travels about there's one director who loves shipyards. <laughs> so we'd go to a place and we'd say, oh, day off tomorrow. No, nope, there's a nice shipyard. Very good, very <laughs> just been opened up here. Um, and and I, 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 would, I would like to, to, to travel on my own and I would like to travel the way you do. I couldn't do it because I'm, I'm no good at language. I don't, have, I don't put the work in that you do. And I think if you don't have the language, you're really not going to get below the surface much, are you, really? Well, it's mediated always. You have an interpreter yeah. if you have yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I don't know about getting below the surface. I never feel I have. Mm. You know, you go on digging and trying, mm. and um, you do your best. But there's always that feeling that it's eluded you. Mm. Um, too much has eluded you. You mm. haven't understood. And yet you keep, that's, that, that's what keeps you going, is it? Something to try and find out. Yes. Um, to find something fresh. If you felt you different, it, then yeah. you know that would be the end of it, I think. Mm. You yes. never feel really that you've, you've got it. You feel yeah. you've got fragments. Yeah. And in a way, that's what our sort of books are. They are fragments, really. They're a built up of, oh, chance conversations, scenery, incidents, mm. accidents, um, which go in the end to you hope, give a, some sort of picture of a region or a culture um, that is not, uh, not so engineered as, say, an academic study. You're not yeah. saying, it mm. is like mm. this. Mm. Um, you're saying, this is how I experienced mm. it. This is how yeah. it came to me. So it's a sort of senseless yes. um, uh, picture that you're building made up of all these um, things that you hope might give a reader an idea or feeling of what it's like to be here in its smells and scenes and yeah. incidents and people. I um, mean, it's an awful lot of detail. You're brilliant on, on detail. You pick up a little bit of detail, three or four things in a sentence which you've just mm. seen or heard, whether it's, you know, you know, what someone looks like, what they're talking about, where they're sitting, something like that. It's, 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 it's terribly rich and I think that I sometimes do that and we do it with our filming we, it's a yeah. collage you're yes, trying to get a little, of images yeah. which you hope will 
will gel together to show, get a feeling of what a place um, is like. But I think when you're writing and, and purely without film and all that, it's, it's harder but more satisfying. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a different it. sort of satisfaction. Yes. And there's a different sort of dissatisfaction too. And you're never, one never really mm. at ease with what one's done in the end. Do, do you, there's, a, a, I Jan, bring Jan Morris in again, but she said that her, all her books were really one long autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you feel yes. that? That your books are telling you a lot about yourself or are you keeping yourself in the background? Huh? And I try to keep myself in the background, but of course you fail. And to yeah, imagine that you course. can really lose your own culture mm. um, is nonsense. Um, which brings one to the thorny question of what we're doing as yes. lone, male, male, mm. white um, intruders, if you mm. like, from a, a post-colonial country. Yeah. Um, what sort of right we have to utilise other countries and so on. Um, this can be taken to a great extreme and it can be very uncomfortable because one's aware that one... I suppose it comes from Foucault, perhaps, that knowledge is power, mm. and the traveller yeah. has knowledge that yes. those that are being un travelled amongst mm. Mm. don't have. You know, we're in financial position or whatever mm. we are in, and we're able to be mm. and have some sort of access mm. to their country that they, particularly if they're mm. from um, a, a sort of developing countries, don't have. They mm. can't have that knowledge of ours. So you travel with mm. this sort of privilege, if you like. Yes. Um, and you can justly be accused of, in some way, utilising them and mm. appropriating them. And, of course, mm. in the sense that Edward Said said um, that we are um, part of the, or were, travel writers, part of the colonial enterprise in fabricating an East in particular, a Middle mm. East in Said's case, that didn't exist, yeah. um, and often denigrating it. And all that um, one can understand as, mm. a, and a, as a sort of accusation mm. against us. But you take it to its logical alternative and, um, and, and we wouldn't be travelling at all. There yeah. would be no human connection, there would be no effort mm. at understanding or empathy mm. um, and no, no, no connectedness. But I suppose that idea that, the, that you can travel in a pure way, so there's no superior or inferior. You know, you're just, you know, you're all, we're all inhabitants of the planet. And I mean, you talk about knowledge is power, and you go to some societies where they know things um, like where, where the water might be or how to make a boat out of reeds or something like that, which we would never, ever be able to do. And we have right. never produced anything which is better than what they produced right. at the time. And that is good to write and about. And that's, that's good to write yeah, about. And it's yeah. also good to, uh, good to tell people about that, to, to make us realise that we're not sort of Western centric. We mustn't see it all yeah. from our point of yeah. view. But yeah. that, that's a hard thing Absolutely. to do because you're, mm. uh, as I say, we are Western, well, you and I, Western white males mm. plonked down there. That's the mm. way we are. Yeah. But I think, I think one can still um, try and get beyond that to, mm. to um, put across the idea that everybody is, as I say, we're all part of the human race and one should yeah. see um, strength in everybody. Mm. And I think if you always regard um, these relationships as being those of equal, unequal, somebody mm. having power, somebody not having power, eventually, I mean, all human contact descends into a kind of paranoia. Mm. Um, you would have, yeah. you know, uh, so um, one has to do one's best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... I Part of the problem when we were when we were travelling was we moved rather fast, mm. and you would uh, arrive somewhere, say uh, a yurt in Tibet, and the the yak herder had been told we were coming from the BBC and would he come along and, and talk, and that was wonderful because I was travel worn, dishevelled in my chinos and a t-shirt and he put a complete suit on <laughs> he was the yak herder but he got a yeah. suit from somewhere a tie and all that and we had a wonderful conversation i mean he didn't speak the language i didn't speak his language but in the, in the uh, we just talked about he had two children there and 
you know, they, the way they behave is exactly the way children behave at home. You know, one would be sort of saying all the right things and the other would be pushing the other one away and be showing the bottom and behaving generally badly. <laughs> and we had such a... It was, it was yeah. so wonderful to find out that this is a universal yeah. um, uh, relationship. Yeah. And his wife was making butter and all that. And suddenly, instead of me looking as though I'm doing all these things for the camera, it was just the most wonderful sort yeah. of natural... Yeah communication for about 20, 20 minutes or so. And th those moments were, uh, and I, I felt so grateful to him for being prepared to take on this idiot from England, you know, mm -hmm. who'd come and couldn't really stir butter and all that and couldn't mm -hmm. speak the language, but we got, we got something together. Those are very special moments when they, they happen. Yeah. You can't rely on them, but, um, you know, when, when you sort of feel you've crossed a political boundary, a boundary yeah. of race and politics and um, poverty and yes. everything and for found some absolutely common element um, like a, mm. a, a, a a sort of reaching of hands yeah um, it's not too often but yeah it, it happens and they, they are they are he, 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 yes not and, to be too I mean, sentimental about it yeah I think it's important we, but, but, but my real point was that we had this moment and then we just had to go yeah. And by that time, we'd become friends, you know, and it was very nice because mm. you have to have a, a, a friendship on camera, and then you whiz off and off you go and, yes. and wave goodbye, and that, that's yeah. the end of that. Yeah. Do you ever keep in touch with people you, you um, have travelled with, or, or, or um, do they get very, in touch with you? Very rarely. Mm. Um, partly in the old days, certainly in the Soviet Union, because it was dangerous to make such... Mm. Um, and they weren't always aware of how perilous it might be to them yeah, yeah. to have a friendship with you. But in general, um, people, the most of the people I meet, um, you wouldn't do that. It's mm. too complicated. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some of them are even illiterate. Mm. Um, but mostly not. Um, you could. Mm. I have sometimes um, kept <laughs> yeah. the, the last two, the last book I kept in touch with a splendid Russian. Yeah, um, it was your man who... Uh, Alexander, yes. who was yeah. um, great, and who yeah. I later saw on television leading a demonstration oh, really? against Putin in Khabarovsk. Mm. I recognised mm. him even above his mask. Really? You could tell mm. who he was. Yeah. And um, my, um, my very sweet guide in Mongolia, mm. um, I was able to send them the chapters that mm. I'd written about themselves um, for their comments. Yeah. Um, but it, it's pretty unusual, that, yeah. with me. Occasionally I've gone back to um, families that I've known in Central Asia. I remember mm. I did it a certain amount, but not much. I remember going back, there's one deeply embarrassing moment. I'd written about an, uh, an old lady whose husband and father had both been killed in the gulags under Stalin, mm. and yet she was a fervent communist. Um, it was not untypical, um, absolutely... Um, she was a member of the Communist Party. Um, she, it was part of her sort of honour. And yet both these men she loved had been destroyed under Stalin. Mm. And I wrote about this and I sent the book to her family. And when I went back to see the family, her daughter said, she's not going to speak to you. She's sitting mm. out on the balcony there mm. and um, she's never, she absolutely refuses to speak to you. And I thought, oh dear. Um, and uh, eventually she came in um, and I thought she's going to say I found her callous. Mm. And it was nothing of the sort. I'd apparently written that she'd had bandaged legs and she was very mm. offended by this. Mm. And, and all, all, none, nothing else mattered at all. <laughs> I think, uh, just very quickly, because of one wonderful Python thing, I think it's in your China book when you were talking to someone in China and she keeps, she tells you you smell. Yes. You smell. She keeps saying you smell. You're a bit. Describe what it was, really, because it's a lovely moment. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Well, anyway, um, you, you, she, uh, she yes. says you smell a lot, you know, and you go, do I? No, yes, she, and she, it was her accent. Yes. She was speaking English, and she meant smile. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give, it, give us a smell. We're almost out of um, first time, but I thought we should very, very quickly, because I'd be interested to know. I mean, <clears throat> the future of travel and writing about travel, where, where, do you, where do you think it's going at the moment? Are we actually um, 
post-pandemic going to be less comfortable with travel? Uh, is it going to become more complicated? Is, it, is the work that you do and I do going to be still sort of um, um, in demand, or, or is it, or is it, is it going to take a new form? Well, it's nice to think that we still might be doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, I, well. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not sure is the answer. I think it's going to be more complicated because of, um, well, for the obvious things, the uh, climate change, the uh, uh, carbon footprints. Mm. Um, above all, the internet gives the illusion um, that you can go anywhere and do anything um, without going there. Um, uh, it's a complete illusion, I think. There's no substitute mm. for being in the place personally, being vulnerable to it um, on the ground. Mm. Um, and um, I, I think it will affect people then. Mm. Um, people will be tending... I wonder whether they'll be, all become more self-conscious about it. Mm. I don't know, but, um... yeah, it it's, it's dangerous. Um, I mean, if you're sitting in the White House or, or mm. 10 Downing Street and looking at a map and thinking, well, that place is like that, and you begin mm. to feel you can manipulate it, mm. understand it, do it, mm. without ever going there. Mm. And I'd rather think if um, you know, Bush or Blair had spent a few months in the capitals of Iraq or Afghanistan, yeah. they might not have done what they did. Um, yes. it's, uh, the, it'll be interesting to see what happens to travelling. I mean, I do hope we and many others do travel and write as much as possible because it's so important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're all separating into our own little worlds and, and being driven by, as I say, virtual travellers yeah. or virtual uh, opinions of people who've never been to those places. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's going to be a great um, problem ahead. So it let's hope we can travel. But I do think travel writing is becoming interesting because it's um, going in so many different directions. Yeah. There are plenty of interesting travel writers about now. Um, some of them, of course, are travelling for um, out of a sense of um, some sort of personal loss, mm. even. Others out of a, a, a more sort of concentrated fascination mm. with a particular area, like uh, Kap Kasaba, a um, mm. very interesting traveller. Um, I recently was judging the little award for the Stanford Book Awards. And all of them were interesting in quite different mm. ways, um, talented, um, and some in uh, large swathes, some entering countries with a particular bent in mind, mm. like Sophie Roberts, The Lost Pianos of Siberia, um, and others, there's an interesting woman writing about what it means to be black and mm. travel, um, what you yeah. receive yeah. back, mm. and mm. whether, always the problem as to whether you're disliked, you feel for yourself or because you're mm. of your colour. Yeah. Um, the, the, and mm. it, it's become very diversified, I think. That's encouraging. Mm, yes, I think so long mm. as people want to travel and want to write mm. about it, yes. they'll find an audience. Yeah. You want to travel one more book or two more books oh, or would you I'm just go on? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, presumably you have, you want to go on somewhere. I do, yeah. but usually I intersperse the travel books with a novel. With a novel, I know, we haven't um, talked about so your novels. Don't. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Eight of them, <laughs> as well as all the travel books. Anyway, that's great. Thank you. Thank it's you. A nice time. We've got to now, we, we are coming to, yes, now I think is our time, um, and it's now time to ask for uh, questions. And, oh, here we are. Yes, it's working very well. I'm not very good on these things. Um, you're going to have a... Heart transplant, well, I <laughs> very quickly done. <laughs> hmm. All right, this is quite interesting ones here. This is from um, Robert Fraser, who says, Is the widespread use of the English language overseas an advantage or a disadvantage to the English travel writer? Quite a catch there. Um, well, I, I would say for me, it's it's an enormous advantage because I can talk to many more people. But I, you know, I suppose it's a question of whether the way people use English is in a sort of rather constricted way, and they're not really saying what they'd like to say in their 
real language, but... I, I've usually found an advantage uh, to yeah. it. It can be a great relief. Yes. Um, but I wouldn't want to be confined to an English-speaking part of a country, mm. the populace of the country. Ob obviously, that's too restricting. But I, I must say, it's a delight to find a good English speaker suddenly. Yeah. Uh, and there are many more now. I mean, it's becoming a lingua franca, really. Um, and let's have a look here. Um, uh, yes, here we are. This is from Ruth McKee, who says... Oh, no, here we are. This is a good one. Judith Olnap. Sorry, Judith. Sorry, Ruth. <laughs> 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 You've been bumped, um, but we'll get back to yours in a minute. Uh, so Judith Allnut writes, from, from all your travels amongst different peoples with their varied beliefs and mores, do you agree with Alice Walker that we're more alike than we are unalike? Oh. <laughs> you? Is that another thing we, we hope we are? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, but no, I, 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 no. I, 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 think, I think we're more alike. Than we'd expect, than, we, than you would expect, just from various Ooh. moments I've had with people. You know, not, yeah. not I mean, at a, at a basic level, mm -hmm. the things people worry about all over the world mm -hmm. are sort of fairly common. You know, the house, the food, mm -hmm. the children, the, the relationships, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I find that's that always surprises me. Yeah. Well, I, I stick with that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> You're making it rude. Let's see now. Okay, we'll get Ruth McKee because Ruth will be on giving him a hard time if I don't do this. <laughs> Have either of you ever been disappointed when you arrive somewhere you've read about only to find it's nothing like its description in literature? <laughs> ah. Ah. I always remember a wonderful passage in your Sahara book in which um, you're approaching Timbuktu and seeing the walls, and it's by moonlight and there are bats yeah. flying around, and you just say, just the one says, this is where I leave home, you say. Yes. But then you enter Timbuktu, yeah. and it's uh, no, I, not... No, absolutely, East Grinstead, it isn't. Yes. No, no, I mean, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think the answer is yes, you, do, yes. you, you can be disappointed. Um, I'm trying to think of places that have disappointed me. Um, but, I mean, that's... Yeah, I can't, I, I mean, can't think of a specific place, but that's... Timbuktu was certainly um, so sad, really. And it, yeah. was, it wasn't sad in an interesting, melancholic way. <laughs> it was just rather desperate. Yeah. And, and, and now, of course, I don't think we'll be able to go there at all. The other two places, I mean, which I did disappoint me, um, and, and this is relevant to literature, one was the North Pole and the other was the South Pole. <laughs> um, and not there's a great deal of literature about the North Pole, but uh, because it's on, on ice flows and all that, it's, it's on water. But the South Pole, uh, certainly I read so much about Scott and Amundsen and Shackleton and the adventures they had down there. And uh, we eventually got there um, in a plane, landed in the middle of the night, um, and there you were at the very sort of you know, southern tip of the world, and all you could see were just pallets full of uh, equipment, trucks and lorries and things like that, and underneath underneath the ice, just very close to where you could stand on the South Pole itself, a place that sort of shacked, uh, Scott had reached and found Amazon's flag and little notes saying, we've, we've been here already. Um, there was a, 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 a big American base, or American-run base, underneath the ice, where they were serving sort of blueberry muffins and all that sort of thing, and everyone was wandering around in Bermuda shorts and listening to <laughs> Chicago. You know, I thought, well, I've come all this way, and this is, this is the reality. But the great thing is, if you arrive and you're a foreigner, you're not, you're not allowed into a place like that. Um, there's special sort of protocols there. You have to be a scientist and all that. You can't just turn up, <laughs> as people do at the South Pole, and say, can I have a shower? <laughs> so adding a certain sort of tinge of tension, because we, we were, in the end, allowed someone smuggled us in to have a shower. But then we had to go on, out onto the ice again and spent the night on, on, the, on the ice. So there you are, Ruth. That was a very good question. Now, um, 
so questions from the audience, because we've got a bit of time. We've got another about five minutes from some audience questions. There's a gentleman up there. Sir, have you got there's a mic coming to you? Oh, sorry, it's been hijacked by somebody else. Okay, sorry, I was aiming at you. But yeah, carry on. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's very nice listening to you. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, my question is to uh, Michael, would you be interested in repeating your Around the World in 80 Days and trying to complete it within the restricted COVID times that we're living in? <laughs> no, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, does, I must say the COVID period uh, <coughs> has totally disrupted all my travel plans. I've been very strange because I had had a heart operation, so I had to take six months off while that sorted itself out. Then COVID happened. And for 18 months, I'd not been anywhere outside my home in London and Hampstead Heath, near where I live for walks and all that. And it was out, uh, after 18 months, my first trip away from home was to Bradford. So that's the travelling I do nowadays. Um, I can thoroughly recommend Bradford. But uh, uh, no, the answer is I don't, I don't think I'd put myself through that again. Yes, the gentleman there just it was second time lucky. <laughs> yeah. So my question is for you, Mr. Thubron. I was reading somewhere that you you've been to Persia, Iran in the past. So I was wondering what you make of it, and if you've written a book extensively about your experiences in there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I wrote only a little of it of Iran, Persia. Um, in a book called Shadow of the Silk Road, um, which I passed through um, the northern part from Meshed across to Tehran. Um, and uh, so it was a very, um, a very limited experience of the country, but very wonderful. I travelled there earlier in the 1970s, um, which was fascinating because it was before the Shah, before the revolution. And uh, that was more interesting because one could see the tensions in the country. Even in Tehran, you could see the, the northern part of the city um, occupied by a, a middle class and wealthy. And in the south, this great sweltering, um, huge uh, suburb in um, Tehran of the disenfranchised, the rural poor who'd come in. And you felt a... Um, something brooding there, um, even in the late 70s or mid 70s. But um, it, it was a beautiful country. I, I loved it. Um, and when I was last there, um, there were no tourists and nothing. And I had places like um, Mashhad, for instance, to myself. Um, so it's a country I'd love to go back to because people seem to be, in spite of being called the axis of evil and so on, People were endlessly polite and friendly to me. I just hitchhiked across the country. There should be a sort of Axis of Evil tours, really. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. I've been the Axis of Evil. North, North Korea was terrific. Yes, yeah. 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 Total surprise, really. You, I mean, you yeah. wrote quite benignly about, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. about North Korea. Yeah, but we, we, we yes. all weren't shown the nasty bits. But no. I mean, again, but an still. example of people being like or unlike, mm -hmm. of people about. Once they were, once they trusted us, were extremely yeah. friendly. Yeah. Anyway, we should have one one more question. I, I mean, think because we we have to end. Well, we'll have two. Anyone up there, at the back there? Yes, gentleman there with the mask on. <laughs> well, <laughs> quickly oh, take it off. Nothing, gentlemen. Mm. First of all, thank you both very much indeed. Where let us see him travel becomes possible again, as 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 we know it and love it. Where would you each like to go where you've never been before? Mm. <laughs> well, almost anywhere, really. Um, that I've never been before. I think I, I, I haven't been to Central America, uh, um, Mexico, very briefly, and I'd quite like to go to Costa Rica because I hear interesting things about that country and the way they're sort of tackling the problems there and the environmental problems. I'd like to see just what they're doing and how, how they're dealing with it. I still have a fantasy of going to Chile, which I don't know at all. Um, I, there's a beautiful part in mm. the south of Chile called the Torres del Paine, yes. 
yeah. which is a national park, Absolutely. which is quite spectacular, I believe. And I'd love to go hiking there if I still can with my wife, who outstrips me on the hiking. And um, uh, it, you can take a boat, I believe, down the, almost the whole coast of Chile, from the Atacama Desert down. And um, these glaciers are falling into the sea, I don't think disintegrating too badly yet. Um, and it, it's quite beautiful. So I have an idea that um, that may be next, if I'm lucky. Great. Oh, very good choice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one more. Um, Sorry, I know, yes, no, you're right there. Gentleman in the front, yeah. Good evening, Mr. Subron. Good evening, Mr. Palin. Um, I've read books, both of your works, some of your works. A very quick question just occurred to me, addressed specifically to, towards Mr. Subron. When you find yourself out on the road, and I'm referring in particular, having read the first book I read of yours was in Siberia, and I know that you took the Trans-Siberian Express and that you made sort of detours out into what was really quite remote wilderness in a sense. What happens when you're on the road and you're not quite sure where you're going to be spending the night and darkness begins to fall? How do you handle that? Because you're a lone traveller. Oh, um... Probably by misplaced self-confidence that it's going to be all right. Um, and it usually is. I mean, the Russians are endlessly hospitable. And in these uh, rough places, um, anybody will take you in. I've been lucky, I suppose. Um, I've been lucky. But um, that's, there's no planning for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't get on your iPhone and, and plan ahead. So you, you, you really just have to trust Maybe foolish, but um, so far it's worked and I'm mm. still here. Thank you very much. Have you ever had so much vodka that you've not known where you are? Because <laughs> you're talking about Russian yes. hospitality. It isn't yes. cocoa and Horlicks, is it? Um, it's several very no, strong vodkas. I have. You're, you're forced to. Yeah. The Russians say forced it, to. if you, um, if you yeah. don't drink with them, then you're spoiling the fun. Yeah. If we drink alone, we're drunks. They say, if we drink with two or more, mm. um, we're having a party. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, no, I've been horribly drunk. I You've been to those tables where you have to toast, and every time you stand up, and it's 18 right. people, that's 18 yeah. vodkas. Yes, and then the toasts have gone all the way around, and they've toasted everything, from your dog to your country to your politics, and then they start again. <laughs> after, <is it? laughs> yeah. We, um, we did that in, in a place in Russia where we... I was, a, it was a film director. I was making a film about crayfish. I can't remember why. Um, and I was enrolled to act as the, the hand that picked the crayfish out. And this was, of course, a great celebration in the evening. 18 of his friends came, so we had 18 of these yeah. vodkas. And as you say, yeah. toast everything. I remember getting up, and this is on camera, and saying, I like to say how wonderful it is to be here, and I like to toast my football team. Sheffield United. <laughs> oh, Sheffield United. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it is, uh, you have yes. to let go, don't yeah. you? Yes, all of them um, are the <laughs> 22. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, yeah. After that, we got back to the hotel and we heard that one of the um, top sort of uh, vice presidents of Russia was going to be staying in the hotel that night. Yeah. <laughs> and so Basil, the photographer, and I sat outside and so said, we're going we're to stop him and we're going to ask him a little bit about, you know, Russia and what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I mean, it wasn't him at all. And uh, <laughs> the next morning I woke up and I was, I felt so desperate to throw up that I, I raced for the basin in the corner of my room stood over it, and the basin came away from the wall. It wasn't, it wasn't attached to anything, it was just a pipe. So I had to race round, finding where I could throw up. And by the time I'd done that, I didn't want to throw up at all, which I think is a, a suitable point to end this learned discussion <laughs> on literature. Thank you, Colin. It's really been a joy talking Thank you, to man. you. Thank you all very much indeed for coming along. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Michael and Colin. I'm going to hold you on stage for one second more. Actually, I think we may let you escape so that you can go to the signing, so you can run out while I do the boring bits. But thank you very much. <laughs> we'll be applauding you from in here out to out there. Um, I'm very pleased as well that uh, we'll be able to bring you even more in explorations of travel writing with our next event with the British Library, which will be a celebration of Jan Morris's work uh, a year after her death. Join us on Thursday the 25th of November to hear from Sarah Moss, Pico Ayer, CN Lester and Shahid Abari. <laughs> That event is going to be free online uh, to RSL members and fellows and public tickets can be bought through the British Library. Membership of the RSL starts at £40 per year and is open to all. So it's a steal. It's a steal. Um, as a member of the RSL, as well as free tickets to our events, you'll receive our quarterly newspaper, our mutual friend, uh, and our annual magazine, the RSL Review, both of which will be arriving with members in the next six to eight weeks. I'm looking to the magazine's editor. <laughs> we a mutual bond there. <laughs> uh, so please sign up today. If you're watching uh, at home and you want to come to all of our events online for free, you can register for a digital events pass for £25. Still to come this season, we've got events with speakers including Chris Riddell, Joyce Carol Oates, Kit Duvall, Val McDermott, Patrice Lawrence, Jack Underwood, Alex Wheatall, Gwen Adshead and Irenison Nakoji. Uh, our members, fellows and newsletter subscribers will also hear some more from us on the 30th of November with some very special announcements for our 201st birthday uh, as part of our five-year RSL 200 festival. So you can join our newsletter mailing list on our website to hear some of the news of those. Um, before you go to buy books from Colin and Michael, which they're going to be signing outside, uh, or which you can buy online through bookshop.org and support independent bookshops, I want to send us out to them with a huge final thank you and a round of applause for Michael. <laughs>